Okay, I think this is, um, we have a good group of folks joining us today, so we will get started. Thank you so much. Good morning and welcome to NIFA's info session about the new Arts Here grant program. I am Adrian Petrillo. I'm the Senior Program Director for New England Presenting and Touring at NIFA. My pronouns are she, her. Before we begin today, I would like to start by acknowledging the land on which we are based. At the New England Foundation for the Arts, we believe that one of the roles of the arts is to make the invisible visible. We also believe that it is not the responsibility of those who have been made invisible to remind us that they are still here. Therefore, as a committed ally and as artists, the New England Foundation for the Arts wishes to acknowledge that the ground on which NIFA is based is the tra traditional lands of the Massachusetts, Wampanoag, and Nipmuc people. We honor their ancestors, past, present, and future, and recognize their continued existence and contributions to our society. Today's uh, presentation does have uh, many accessibility uh, functions available. To enable captions on your screen, please select the caption setting in your Zoom controls, which are likely on the bottom of your screen. To access captions in languages other than English, you must be using a Windows or Apple computer with Zoom meeting client version 5.11.2 or higher. Language translation services are not available on mobile devices. I also want to thank our ASL interpreters today, Chelsea and Joanna. And also a big thank you to our friends at HowlRound who are live streaming this session today. Our next slide, please. Today's webinar will offer an overview of the Arts Here program, as well as a Q&A session. To ask a question in today's webinar, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom interface, which is located alongside your other Zoom controls, likely on the bottom of your screen. We will answer questions either verbally throughout the presentation or at the end during the Q&A um, or through a written response in the chat. But please do ask your questions. That's why we're here today. So our agenda for today will cover the new Arts Here program. We will talk about what it is. We will talk about who it's for, the application process, the program details, and then we will finish with a question and answer session. What is Arts Here? That is probably a big question on many people's minds. So NIFA, New England Foundation for the Arts, is one of six regional arts organizations in the U.S. We are non we are all nonprofit organizations, but we also partner regularly with the National Endowment for the Arts. And we are so happy to partner with the NEA and our fellow regional arts organizations on the launch of Arts Here. So this is a new program that comes from the NEA and the, all six regionals. Arts Here is a capacity building project grant that supports the work of nonprofits in all US states and jurisdictions. This program is also an opportunity for more Americans to experience artful lives in their communities. Arts Here reflects goals and objectives identified in the National Endowment for the Arts 2022 to 26 strategic plan. These goals and objectives uh, include uh, supporting opportunities for all people to participate in the arts and arts education and integrating uh, the arts with strategies that promote the well-being and resilience of people and communities. The arts here goals ensure that arts that everyone has access to arts participation. It's also about promoting the well-being and resilience of people and communities and building the capacity and infrastructure of the arts sector. The intent of Arts Here is to strengthen the capacity of organizations that are already engaging with underserved groups and communities to boost arts participation and connect these organizations to each other and bolster their uh, work together. 
In the long term, investments made through the arts here program will build cap grantees capacity to sustain their meaningful community engagement and increase arts participation for underserved groups or communities. I will now pass it over to my colleague Audrey Serafin, who will get into more of the specifics about arts here as well as the application process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian. Uh, my name is Audrey Serafin. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the program manager for regional grants and initiatives uh, here at NIFA. And right now that really means uh, all things arts here. Um, so to, uh, to continue on what Adrian was saying, um, there are three core components to arts here. The first of which is obviously investment. Uh, these are grants ranging from $65,000 to $130,000, um, and those are non-matching grants that don't have, um, so you don't have to uh, secure funding to match these grants. They're, you know, just uh, just for you. Um, there are also two other components that we find really exciting beyond your typical uh, uh, grant-focused program. One of those is a learning component, which will involve both regional and national cohort um, opportunities, uh, including one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, coaching sessions, monthly cohort meetings, and quarterly workshops. Uh, additionally, the NEA will be working to evaluate arts here outcomes and results to help determine the future of this pilot program um, and hopefully other programs like it that make substantial investment to community-based arts organizations. Uh, next slide, please. But who is Arts Here for? So Arts Here is not just for arts organizations, um, but it's for any organizations that present arts programming to underserved communities. We're also looking for arts organizations, specifically nonprofits, um, who are committed to equity and are able to show that sustained commitment um, that aligns with Arts Here's values. Um, organization, even though that these are quite large grants, we know that small organizations can responsibly steward large grants. So the this arts here is also for organizations of all sizes um, who have a capacity building project in mind that fits inside um, the arts here guidelines. Um, uh, next slide, please. So what that looks like with eligibility is, as I mentioned, uh, you do need a, a nonprofit tax exempt 501c3 status to apply, um, but federally recognized tribes and tribal communities are also welcome to apply. Non federally recognized tribal communities that are nonprofit and tax exempt are also eligible to apply. Next slide, please. Uh, we did want to highlight some notable exceptions to eligibility that. Um, uh, have come up as we've been talking in community about this program. Um, unfortunately, fiscally sponsored organizations or organizations working in partnership um, are not eligible to apply to arts here. You do need your own 501c3 um, and you can't uh, apply with a partner organization. Um, colleges and universities are also um, not eligible for arts here funding. Uh, I know that it's a bit tough in New England where our um, you know, world-class education institutions uh, offer a lot of support to our arts community. But um, if you do have a separate 501c3 from your college or university, you would be eligible. Um, but I know a lot of that is embedded, unfortunately, with colleges who often also have their own 501c3. Uh, K-12 schools, both private and public, are not eligible for this, and neither are uh, units of state or local government, uh, given that this is a a grant from the federal government. Uh, next slide, please. So um, one of the last couple of points on eligibility are that each organization must have at least three years of arts or cultural programming experience. Um, I also want to note that the grant that this is, since this is a project grant, it has a performance period, which is between October 1st, 2024 and June 30th, 2026. Uh, we are also seeking uh, capacity building projects to support with this grant that do have, as I mentioned earlier, a budget between $65,000 and $130,000 with no matching 
requirement there. Next, awesome. Uh, so what is a capacity building project? This is probably the most frequently asked question we get um, in our office hours. My colleagues say who will be speaking in a moment can verify. Um, but a capacity building project is really anything that helps develop or strengthen the skills, instincts, abilities, processes, and resources to survive, adapt, and thrive in a fast changing world for your team and your arts organization. So really any project that supports, sustains or strengthens the organization's ongoing and existing work with underserved communities uh, can be considered a capacity building project. Um, now it's very broad and I know the guidelines don't give a lot of concrete examples because they're looking for people to be creative uh, and uh, really, you know, rise to this sort of new kind of grant uh, with their own ideas. But um, if we go to the next slide, we have a couple examples. Um, so there are, these are um, listed under some of the allowable costs in the arts here guidelines, but field research to help strengthen uh, and deepen existing bonds and commitments with underserved communities strategic planning or logic model development or implementation, marketing or promotional activities, including uh, rebranding or uh, creative uh, storytelling, succession or planning or leadership training, uh, a needs assessment, whether for um, accessibility of physical uh, structures or overall equity and uh, accessibility of your organization, staff EDI training and development uh, all count as uh, capacity building projects that Arts Here could fund. Um, and of course, at the end, we will be getting to a question and answer segment. So if you have more specific questions, um, we're always happy to answer those uh, here or at another time. One thing I do wanna note is that uh, a capacity building project is not an arts project. Um, so for example, if you have a concert you feel will really speak to uh, a historically underserved community you serve, we wouldn't really count that as a capacity building project as it's a one-off event uh, and doesn't really promote sustained engagement with that community. However, if you wanted to research that community, see how uh, the music that your arts organization produces really speaks to them or perhaps doesn't, work with the community directly, maybe in a community advisory group, to uh, develop an ongoing series of programming directly with them, that process is something that Arts Here could fund. We're just encouraging folks not to apply with a specific production or uh, event in mind, just because uh, it's not gonna be as competitive next to a strategic plan, a succession plan, something that shows longer commitment and engagement, uh, both to equity and to continuing the work of the organization itself. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague Say, who will talk a little bit more about uh, deadlines and application process. Great, thanks Audrey. Hi, my name is Sejin Yu. I use she, her pronouns, and I am NEPA's program coordinator for regional initiatives. I'll be explaining more about the arts here application process, which is in two parts. And part one is the statement of interest and applicants can apply by January 19th, 2024. For part two, the full application, applicants from part one will be invited to apply and the deadline is April 19th. Lastly, grantees will be announced in August, 2024. Next slide, slide please. All right, so for part one, the statement of interest, there are three primary review criteria. The first is organizational capacity and the capacity building project that you propose in your statement of interest. The second is alignment with arts here's commitment to equity. And finally, engagement with historically underserved communities, which arts, arts here defines as race, race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, disability, and geography. And next slide, please. So the statement of interest deadline is January 19th, 2024 by 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. Next slide, please. All right, so to apply, we recommend folks visit artshere.org. All the information about the Arts Here program can be found on the website. 
and we recommend you visit before you submit your statement of interest. On the website, you'll find the arts here guidelines, as well as more on expectations, the timeline, and resources. And also on the arts here website, you can find the application platform called GoSmart to start and submit your statement of interest. Next slide, please. Um, so GoSmart. Um, once you're on the GoSmart website, here are a few tips. First, make sure you're applying in the correct region. Scroll down on the GoSmart website until you see this section for NEPA and start your application there. Second, many of you have never used GoSmart before, but even if you have in the past, you'll have to create a new account. The third tip is to not delay starting your profile and your application. Lastly, please save your application often so you don't lose any progress and hard work. And with that, I'll pass it back over to Audrey to go over support. I'm muted. Thank you so much, Say. I really appreciate it. Um, so as uh, Say mentioned, the statement of interest uh, form is now open. Um, so if you run into any technical issues as you work on your statement of interest that are quite specific, we do recommend you getting in touch with our friends at uh, West Staff, which is the uh, westernmost regional arts organization delivering this grant, um, including our technical services, their email arts here at gosmart.org on the slide is the best way to get in touch with them. But any and all other questions, eligibility, native, narrative, programmatic, um, please feel free to email arts here at nefa.org or give us a call directly at 617-867-1825. Sorry, I'm reading off a very small slide. Um, the uh, But yeah, we also have um, some limited office hours available um, that you can locate on NIFA's website. Um, but given that we only have a handful of slots and we are uh, rapidly approaching uh, the statement of interest deadline, we recommend uh, you emailing or calling us um, instead. Uh, so now I believe if we go to the next section, uh, the next slide, sorry, uh, we are now available to take your questions. I believe you can only ask them through the Q&A feature. Um, I don't see any yet, uh, but uh, Say will let me know if I'm mistaken. I don't think we see any yet. Oh, there's a question here. Okay. So Audrey, the first question says, for organizations that currently do arts programming as part of general community building activities, how should the three years be tracked? For instance, we have youth programming that often includes an artistic component, but not as part of a directed arts curriculum. Similarly, we have a maker space that is sometimes used for artistic projects and sometimes used for inter entrepreneurship programming. Great. So, uh, yeah, I'll address the tracking question here. So uh, you don't need to have... Um, the three years of program activity don't need to be consecutive. We acknowledge that... Um, the COVID-19 pandemic interrupted a lot of the great arts work um, that uh, your organizations were doing. Um, however, I think in terms of the arts component curriculum, makerspace, uh, I believe, again, arts programming really just sort of speaks to providing any sort of arts or cultural programming to an underserved community. And I should mention uh, that underserved communities uh, for the purposes of this grant are not age specific. I see that you mentioned youth programming here. Um, we do find that there's often ways that nonprofits are able to talk about their students uh, beyond their age, whether that's um, through their race and ethnicity, uh, their socioeconomic status, geographic uh, location. There are other, you know, of the specific uh underserved communities definition. Given um, by the NEA, there are other ways that many students fit in that category, but um, I would just like to point out that uh, age alone um, isn't going to uh, make that community underserved. Our programming, I'm just reading Maxwell's follow-up. Programming is place-based and lo location fits the general criteria. Wonderful. So yeah, if you have three years of arts programming experience with that population, 
um, regardless of what it is or if it's consecutive, uh, you should be eligible to apply. Great, thanks, Audrey. Our next question um, is, if staffing is an eligible expense, um, such as hiring a staff member as part of capacity building? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, so yes, staffing is an eligible expense. Um, in terms of hiring a new staff member, you would just need to illustrate in your statement of interest how it's part of your capacity building project. Um, I suppose hiring staff, uh, for example, uh, some organizations have spoken about uh, wanting to hire an executive director or, um, uh, you know, a, a full-time staff position where they may not have had one previously. Um, that in and of itself could be a capacity building project, but um, more often, usually increased staffing or staff time even uh, would be an eligible expense as it uh, pertains to the capacity building project, whether that's community engagement, um, marketing activities, field research, uh, also, lots of folks are applying um, to bring on consultants or sort of temporary uh, advisors for their capacity building project, and those are eligible expenses as well. Any more questions from folks? All right, here's our next question. Are art service organizations eligible? And do our programs like awards or grant programs count for arts programming? Um, yeah, so arts service organizations um, are can be eligible. It really depends on the kind of programming that you're delivering. Um, I will say awards and grants programs, this particular grant um, is not it is not for regranting. Um, so if you're speaking about a financial award that's given to someone that wouldn't be a good fit. Um, but uh, I do think that uh, we have some arts service organizations who are applying, um, looking to strengthen the capacity of their organization as it, you know, then goes on to serve uh, the underserved populations other arts organizations are working with in the region. Great, thanks, Audrey. Um, our next question is, um, they understand that one-off concerts are not eligible, but if you have a series that serves underserved communities um, that you would like to expand, would that count? Um, yeah, great question. Uh, the answer is potentially. It sort of depends on the project. We've just been really encouraging folks to look at this as an opportunity to step back and really think about what your organization needs from an operational and sustainability standpoint. Um, we're encouraging folks not to apply with a series of events um, unless it really speaks to a larger initiative that will continue beyond uh, the grant performance period. So while all eligible expenses have to fall within that October 1st, 2024 to June 30th, 2026 uh, timeframe, the impact of that work should be long lasting beyond that. At least that's the hope. Thanks, Audrey. All right, we have no questions at this moment. So take a second to see if any more questions come in. also okay if there are no questions. Um, we uh, do hope that this has been helpful for folks um, and do encourage you to reach out to us directly, um, particularly with specific questions if uh, we have not been able to uh, answer them uh, to your satisfaction here. Audrey, we have a question that just came in. Um, how many organizations do you expect will apply? That is a great question and one I cannot fully answer as uh, this is a pilot program and there's really no precedent for um, an application like this before. We are um, anticipating uh, a large number of applications uh, and we're anticipating um, those coming from organizations of all sizes, hopefully from all uh, the New England states. Um, but if I had to put a number on it, I would say in the low hundreds, maybe. 
Great. Thanks, Audrey. Um, the next question is, what might the acceptance slash award rate be? Yeah, again, the math on that is pretty difficult, um, but we do expect this grant to be really competitive. Great. Our next question is, does each region have an equal number of slots to fill? This is a great question. So um, the uh, grant awards, as uh, mentioned on the national webinar, there will be about 95, potentially more, uh, awardees uh, across the country. Um, but in each region, those uh, awards are being distributed by uh, population size. So uh, it may not be a surprise to any of you that uh, NIFA is the smallest region population-wise, uh, represents the smallest re region population-wise. Um, so no, not each region has an equal number of slots to fill. Um, there is uh, some variance there given that we're serving a much smaller population size than some of our uh, regional counterparts. Great. Um, someone is asking if you can talk a little bit more about definitions of programming for the past three years that we need to provide, and if those three years need to demonstrate dedicated work with communities that fit one or more of those four areas. Yeah, so um, again, this particular statement of interest is pretty brief, uh, and we have been getting some feedback that the character limits are pretty narrow. So um, I don't believe you have to speak a little bit about your programming history and your history with these underserved communities. We don't want um, folks to be applying and not have any experience with these folks who are uh, going to be served by the project. We are looking from some history of pre-existing relationships. Um, the three years of arts programming really just speaks to being active in community um, and ideally with those uh, with your underserved community, which, again, doesn't need to fit into all four of those areas, um, but should be able to be defined by uh, one of those sort of um, underserved community filters that I know is a question towards the end of the statement of interest. Um, I'm trying to think if there's other definitions of programming is really just, uh, you know, are you putting on, it depends on your organization, right? So are you putting on uh, concerts or lectures? Are you having um, active exhibitions in your gallery space? Are you a community center that offers classes or um, has, done, uh, spe has done specific work to uh, allow your space to be used by um, folks from different communities. Uh, again, it sort of depends more on the organization, but um, arts programming just generally means years of activity uh, doing arts and cultural programming for the wider community, but ideally for the historically underserved community you'll speak about in your statement of interest. Fantastic. Thanks, Audrey. Um, our next question is, do you see grants being prioritized for rural areas and likewise, would orgs in major cities not be prioritized? Um, great question. Uh, I do think, uh, I, I don't see any prioritization on this sort of urban, rural um, divide. Again, I think we'll see uh, grantees from both cities and remote areas. Uh, I think, I think that more rural uh, I think we'll see different kinds of applications. I think that we'll have some uh, rural grantees that can speak to providing arts access to folks who are, uh, you know, geographically quite a distance from some other uh, arts opportunities in more urban centers. Um, but I don't see major cities not being prioritized, particularly given that um, those cities tend to be more uh, racially and ethnically diverse. And that is another um, filter of sorts for underserved uh, communities in this grant. Thank you. And we currently have no questions, so please feel free to throw them into the chat. Oh, all right. We have another one. Um, the question says, um, we are fiscal sponsors to several groups that we work deeply in partnership with, viewing fiscal sponsorship as a way to empower leaders in some of our underserved communities. 
It's an important service we provide. Is that of value to mention or should we just not talk about fiscal sponsee partnerships? Yeah, that's a little tricky. So I think in terms of, again, I think this question is coming from the art service organization uh, that asked some questions earlier. Um, I think working in community with uh, especially uh, leaders from underserved communities is definitely important. Um, but I think in terms of speaking to, it, it depends right on who your uh, underserved community you're defining is, right? So if the underserved community you're defining is maybe BIPOC led, BIPOC serving arts organizations, um, and your fiscal sponsorship or a capacity building to support your fiscal sponsorship is uh, is part of um, you know your your key argument and your statement of interest. Uh, I could definitely see talking about that being relevant. Um, but I will mention that in terms of the statement of interest before the sort of part two application, uh, it's pretty um, limited in terms of how much you can write. So, uh, really, we're encouraging folks to be specific around their capacity building project and speaking directly to the programs and services that correlate with that project. Thank you, Audrey. We'll give another minute for any questions that might come in. All right, the next question is, do you need to give a timeline? Uh, good question. Um, I don't, I'm actually looking at uh, guidelines experts say, I don't believe so. Uh, I think that in part two, there is some more detailed information, including, um, you know, a, a fuller project budget, uh, as well as, uh, you know, some evidence of you working towards uh, a realistic process for this capacity building project if funded. Um, but I don't think you need to give a specific part, uh, timeline in part one. Thank you, Audrey. Um, our next question is, do you need to give an idea of what you would spend the money on in part one? Yeah, so definitely, as I mentioned, there's not a specific project budget in part one, but uh, you do need to give your total grant request amount. Uh, so we're encouraging folks to think about that full project budget, at least before you finish your statement of interest, because um, what we don't want to happen is, you know, obviously the instinct is to go for the most amount of money. Obviously, there's a lot of need in our community. Um but if you put in on part one for a $130,000 project with really no thought of how that's going to be spent, and then you do move to part two, and you can really only find maybe $70,000 worth of, ex of expenses, that's not going to be super good comparing um, that part one statement of interest to your final application. We do want those amounts to be pretty congruent. So um, you do need to have an idea, um, especially as you're talking about the capacity building project that's being funded. Um, you know, you don't need the line by line item expenses, but yes, you should have an idea of what you would spend uh, the grant on in your part one statement of interest. Great. We have no open questions at this time. Anyone else has any questions to throw into the Q&A? Please go ahead. All right, I think I'll slowly bring us to a close. Again, leaving some space, I'm sure some people are maybe typing furiously and I don't want to cut that off prematurely. Um, but we thank um, everyone um, for joining us today, whether on the uh, HowlAround live stream or directly here on Zoom in the webinar. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Say and I are available at artshere at nefa.org. Uh, if you have additional questions or want to set up a time to chat further about your application, 
Um, I, oh, we have another question, um, so I'll pause. Great, we have another question. Um, if we want to hire a staff member to do more outreach and therefore more programs, is that okay? It involves arts programming. So yeah, as I mentioned earlier, staffing can be uh, an eligible expense. Again, it it revolves around the capacity building project as a whole. Um, so if your capacity building project is you're looking to uh, increase support of your uh, full-time staff, and that looks like adding a position and potentially some professional development or leadership training, then yeah, definitely include, um, in the end, you'll want to include those expenses of recruitment as well as starting uh, the position. I will note too, in terms of sustainability, uh, I would encourage you to think carefully around uh, how you would continue to fund those positions beyond the grant performance uh, timeline. Uh, since the, um, since what we don't want is to set up some people to be, uh, brought on for this project and then let go when funding is lost. But, um, I'm hoping, uh, that, um, I'm hoping that, you know, this will create some new career opportunities for some wonderful arts administrators. Um, and, uh, those opportunities will continue beyond June, 2026. Fantastic. Our next question is if you will send out the slides. Um, people, It looks like people would like to see examples of what might count as capacity building. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we can, I'll talk with our comms team, but whether it's via email or potentially posting these slides on the uh, Arts Here NIFA webpage itself, um, we can find a way to distribute those. Um, I will say the examples of capacity building, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure are copy and pasted from the guidelines. So if you download those, that full PDF um, of guidelines on the Arts Here website, you should be able to see them there now if you don't want to wait for us to upload the slides. Great. Our next question is if number of staff should be stated for the overall organization or just for the subprogram that someone is focusing on for their statement of interest? Awesome, and very specific question. Uh, yeah, the number of staff should be for the overall organization. Um, I believe that our screeners will wanna get a sense of uh, the organization's capacity as a whole and how this project might be uh, expanding that. We have no open questions. All right, I'm gonna resume the this, this slow closing. Uh, unless something pops up. But um, I really do want to, again, thank our friends at HowlAround for live streaming this. Thank our friends at Interpreter Now for providing um, ASL interpretation. Um, and thank my colleagues, uh, Say and Adrian, and uh, Anne in the chat for their support around this program. Um, we really do hope to see your statement of interest before midnight or 11.59 p.m. to be exact on uh, Friday, January 19th. Uh, you know, our support info and e including email and phone number are in the chat um, and available on uh, NIFA's website. If you are seeking more information, uh, Say also authored a really helpful top five FAQ article on the NIFA blog you can take a look at. Um, if you're looking for some more guidance there, we talk about capacity building um, in writing, uh, as well as a couple other areas um, of frequent interest to our office hour attendees. Uh, and yeah, I think um, I, I think that is, thanks for the link for that, Anne, that's awesome. Um, I think that's all we wanted to share today. So um, I will wish you a good rest of your day. Uh, and hope to uh, see you or, you know, your organization via statement of interest application really soon. Take care, everybody.